Hello, I'm Steve Sedgwick and welcome to CNBC's IoT Powering the Digital Economy, where we are looking at the role of leadership in driving sustainability. How can leaders map a path to a future which not only benefits their stakeholders, but mitigates the effects of climate change that we see around us every day? What are the innovations and policy changes that great business leaders must take into account in their future plans to promote growth across the board in a way that's ethical, sustainable and accountable? To discuss this and much more, I'm joined now by Jean-Pascal Tricoire, who is the chairman and CEO of Schneider Electric. Jean-Pascal, thank you for joining me. It wasn't easy a year ago a leading on sustainability, on net zero, or on ESG. Let's start off with the big question. Is it harder now, uh, keeping to those aspirations that you have, that Schneider Electric has, that others in the industry have, of reaching those goals? It always takes leadership to take decisions for ESG and sustainability. But if you look at what is happening now in the field of energy, it's the first time in many years where you've got a complete alignment between the midterm objective to be sustainable or to be net zero on the short term objective to be less sensitive to energy price cost shortages effect. If you look at the new prices of energy across the world, wherever you are, they make any investment in efficiency, in renewable, much more attractive than before. So if you just use common sense, this time, economics on sustainability, responsibility are really more aligned than ever. And yet there is a concern, and we've seen it a couple of times already this century, uh, Jean-Pascal. What's different this time that means that we don't, from a leadership point of view, lose momentum? We see a massive pressure from investors that was not existing three years ago regarding ESG. We see new reporting standards, new regulations coming, asking our companies to respond of our extra financial. And then at the end of the day, companies being based on, of, on people, if you want to attract the best people, you'd better have a plan for sustainability. There is a momentum, there is a movement which is coming from that combined movement taking place from all stakeholders around anybody in the world. It's all very well having leaders left, right and centre, but getting those leaders to work together in ecosystems, this is absolutely key for the success uh, of not only getting to net zero, but potentially, hopefully, getting to net positive at some stage. 99% of our carbon footprint is with our partners. So what are we doing? We are helping our 1,000 key strategic suppliers to cut their emission by a factor of two in the next coming five years. There is a big human factor here which is we need to skill people, we need to think different, we need to train the whole value chain the way we architect buildings, cities, companies in a different manner. So training, education is big, and you need to coalize the people who understand that so that they drive this momentum faster. You are the leader of Schneider Electric, but how much are the employees of companies like Schneider Electric now actually leaders in this field as well, rather than the people sitting in the boardroom like yourself? And I tell you, every approach of sustainability starts with fixing a clear direction, taking decisions, and then picking the right people that will go beyond what you had ever imagined at the beginning. You have to push, and it was said several times in my uh, last meetings, push beyond possible. I'm looking forward to speaking to you many times over the coming days, weeks and months. Thank you, Jean Pascal. I'm looking forward to that too. The need to tackle climate change has taken a particular spotlight in recent years, and business leaders worldwide face continued pressures and a careful balancing act, mapping a path which satisfies the needs of internal and external stakeholders while addressing the issues that the entire planet continues to face. When push comes to shove, these companies put their shareholders, their short-term shareholder return, above the long-term um, uh, future of humanity. And that is not acceptable anymore. Landmark new directives aim to increase scrutiny and transparency on how efficiently businesses are achieving their sustainability goals. At the same time, investors, consumers and employees are increasingly prioritising ESG positive companies in who they buy into, buy from and work for. Companies also need to start to show these ESG impacts of their actions and also their business impacts. What are the business benefits? Uh, behind the sustainability actions. 
And then lastly, but most importantly, start to communicate the performance with all the stakeholders. As complex crises such as costs of living and real-world climate change dominate headlines, leaders must use every tool at their disposal to ensure their organisations can be flexible and adaptable. We need to acknowledge that oil and gas is crucial to the energy system of today. We need to make sure there's sufficient investment into that so that we can get the energy trilemma sorted, which is cleaner energy, secure energy and affordable energy. That's what we need to do. And at the same time, we can invest and will invest and are investing uh, in accelerating that energy transition. As many leaders embrace the new normal and the changing nature of business, are those companies who ignore ESG goals destined to be left behind? We are now at a point where we want to transition out of carbon intense electricity and power generation into low carbon and green energy. So these are some of the transitions that will also speak to not only poverty eradication, but human well-being and above all sustainability. Some fascinating points raised there. And to continue the conversation, I'm joined now by Marco Alvera, the CEO of TES, which is a world leader in building green hydrogen solutions to scale and someone who knows all about mapping the blueprint for a clean energy future. Marco, um, it's always been a pleasure talking to you about sustainability. Just tell me a little bit about how you are continuing to drive through sustainability at this very difficult time. TESS is uh, creating renewable methane from hydrogen and from solar. And we're talking to a lot of the oil and gas companies, a lot of the utilities, gaining a lot of traction because this is a very pragmatic solution. The only bottleneck is the availability of solar panels and electrolyzers. That's where we want policymakers to focus on, building the manufacturing capability to support the revolution. Do you think the leadership has been consistent at a political level, despite companies such as yourself continuing to advocate the move to sustainability? Well, certainly the European policy on energy has always been a piecemeal approach and some governance centrally. Uh, what uh, what the commission and the member states or some member states should really do at this stage is think about a gas purchasing agency to address the molecule crisis, build more LNG infrastructure. And this infrastructure can later be used for hydrogen. So that would address the immediate need for energy and also build out an infrastructure that's not going to be stranded like some people used to think. You make the point, of course, that green hydrogen is, is the gold standard, if I'm not mixing up my colours there as well. The technology needed to get large scale green hydrogen out there in masses. Um, do we have the technology now? If so, who is leading in the technological race, if not? We absolutely have the technology. Uh, China, I would say, uh, by a big margin on solar panels and on the electrolyzers. There's European technologies. There's U.S. technologies. So we have the technology. What we don't have is a manufacturing capability to scale those technologies up in time. And that's where I would like to see more policy focus and more entrepreneurs really investing on the factories. You mentioned that we need the policy initiative no. and we need the entrepreneurs as well. Why aren't we seeing the grouping in the middle, the mass in the middle, these huge industrial behemoths themselves, rather than relying on entrepreneurs and rather than relying on state policy to direct the capital? If I'm running a manufacturing business, before I build a new factory, I want to make sure there's enough demand there. So I'm always going to err on the side of caution. So I think subsidies can go a long way. That's what the US is doing with the IRA. That's what China is doing with its own domestic manufacturing capabilities and hopefully Europe. Uh, follows suit. I think um, it, it, you know, it took it took a Tesla to disrupt the, manu the the car manufacturing sector. It took an Amazon to disrupt the retail market, and I think it's going to take new companies to disrupt the energy sector. So existing companies have an inertia, a lack of leadership because of their other responsibilities. Is that the case? I don't want to say they have lack of leadership because there's some outstanding companies with outstanding leadership. I think it's uh, it's always the uh, agile companies that can really do a kind of a you know zero-based design uh, and and build the whole organization around the purpose, around the speed of execution, around the seriousness. This is about taking some of the West Coast uh, mentality, some of the Tesla mentality, some of the you know we can do it and we can do it quickly attitude, and and delivering faster than a conventional approach would would be able to deliver. Marco Alvira, I always learn something when I'm speaking to you and it's always a pleasure, sir. So thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Steve. Thanks a lot.